Hey, welcome. If it is Tuesday, that means it's Comic Book School Live because we own Tuesdays. Today is June 14th, 2022. If you can believe, the summer is upon us. If you're the first time creator hoping to break into comics, a rising talent looking to level up or a well-seasoned pro, we welcome you to Comic Book School where we talk about the craft and business of making comics. And tonight, we're going to be talking a lot about the craft and business. Stay tuned. My name is Buddy Scalera, and I'm the founder of Comic Book School, a place where people just like you can go to learn about the craft and business of making comics, no matter what that means in today's evolving marketplace. I'm also a comic book writer and a publisher with nearly 30 years in this comic book business. And tonight, I'm about to do something I've never done before. I am going to have three guests, pretty much the maximum that I can handle here, uh, three guests who are going to talk about their time working together at Vertigo Comics for DC Comics. That's right. Um, you guys all know that I am a Vertigo uh, aficionado. Uh, it was pretty much uh, the line of comic books uh, that helped me grow up. Uh, as a superhero fanboy through the years, it just took one issue of Sandman. I turned the corner and never looked back, which is why I'm so excited uh, to introduce our guests tonight because uh, they are going to be talking about what it was like to be the original editors of Vertigo. Uh, they'll share some of their stories, their origin stories of getting started in Vertigo. Uh, they will share information about what it was like compared to what it is like now. I think you guys are gonna find some very interesting stories. They'll also give you some educational tips toward the end about how to have a really long and productive career in comics because if you can believe it, all of these creators have continued a very strong and exciting career in comic books. They've all appeared on the show. They all have active products, products, projects. So uh, I can see the comments already starting to come in. I know that, uh, yeah, already. Oh, all right. Well, good. I'm glad you're looking forward to it. So uh, I'm going to introduce them in order of when I met them. I feel like that's the only fair way. This way we can uh, do introductions. So I met my first guest when I was on assignment uh, working for Wizard Magazine. Uh, I was covering the rebirth, the reboot of the Valiant Universe, uh, which is being reboot by Fabian Nicieza. And they sent me there for this, um, this basically a retreat. And uh, during this retreat, I was able to meet all these different creators, including this one particular creator who was very funny throughout the entire event uh, came along, wrote some wonderful titles. I had not known that at that point that he had been editing uh, at, at Vertigo. Uh, much to my delight, I found out that he was. He was a terrific uh, uh, person. We had a lot of fun talking. Please welcome uh, Tom Pyre, who uh, joins us here from the Ahoy Comics Studios. <laughs> hey, buddy. Nice to see you. Thank you for that nice intro. Tom, you have been in this business a very long time. I mean, when I met you back when they were rebooting Valiant, you were already um, a creator with tons of credits. If you if you had to guess how many comics you have to your credits, just wild guess, what would you say? Because I think you, you have a really big body of work. Yeah, well, it's been going on a while. And I had some busy years. I don't know. I don't know numbers. There's a wonderful site called Mike's Amazing World of Comics. I, perhaps you know it. If you don't, you should. I should. I, I, I checked the comic book database and in preparation for your other two appearances. I was, it just went on and on and on. And Mike, uh, if you look up my name, it'll say how many stories I wrote at the top of the page. But when, when Stan Lee died, I inherited his memory. So I can't even begin to tell you what the <laughs> Well, you're doing great stuff at Ahoy, and uh, I'm really excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. So, but I'm going to introduce my second guest, who I met um, well during right during the pandemic, as we were all going on these live streams. And um, somebody from the New Jersey Science Fiction Club sent me a note and said, "Do you know this person?" And I said, "No, I, I don't. I know the name. I have many of her books." And I just thought, "Well, why not? Let's get to know this person. This person happens to be." Elisa Quitney. Elisa, welcome to the show. You're, you're, I'm so excited to see you. I'm glad you were able to join us. I'm really glad to be able to join. Although I always feel compelled to like get out of my fish dissection t-shirt and put on makeup as opposed to like my real Clark Kent self. 
during the day. Well, uh, you can, you can, I'm, I just am really glad to see you. You have had a great run actually publishing a comic book called Guilt through Ahoy Comics. I hear it's doing very well. Uh, from your mouth to the idea. <laughs> well, it's good work. I read it. We had you on the show and it is, uh, it's a great piece of work and I'm excited. And I know that people that are uh, watching are, are just as excited. I see the thumbs up. Oh, here you go. Here's the audience, Tom. You, you have a, a researcher, Ruth Morrison. Yeah. 322 credits. Well done, Ruth. Ruth sometimes is the substitute teacher. Now, last but certainly not least, um, I, uh, I fanboyed out when I found this book by our next guest, uh, which I didn't even know existed. I recognized the name and it blew me away. You guys uh, were here a couple weeks ago when we interviewed uh, Shelly Bond, who put out an amazing book on the how-to behind comics. She just completed her Kickstarter. She is active as heck with all the different things she's doing. Please welcome Shelly Bond, my newest Vertigo friend. Hello, thank you for having me back. Oh, wouldn't have it any other way. You, you were a great, oh, you're all great guests. Everybody was super excited to see you. And uh, I can see a lot of viewers on tonight. We have a, we have a higher number of viewers than usual. So uh, you guys are attracting the crowd. Uh, I've set up some questions for you so we can have some structure uh, because I figured, you know what, we can go off on as many tangents as you guys want, but I need to stay on track. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the questions to you, and then I'm going to pick you in order of who I met first. So, Tom, that'll put you up first. All right? All right. So we're going to try something different. We're going to be able to see if we can actually show a slide. And you go, oh, I did it. All right. I finally learned how to run oh, no. the switcher. Yeah, I never know how to run the switcher. Okay. So, Tom, we're going to start with you. How did you get to Vertigo? Well, it wasn't Vertigo yet. I became uh, Karen Berger's assistant editor. I had been writing. I've been doing a little writing for DC, and it was kind of dried up. And but I'd worked with this editor, Mark, Mike Carlin, who thought apparently that it would be a funny joke to play on Karen Berger to recommend me as her assistant. <laughs> and, um, so I went in and got interviewed, and I got hired. And uh, she... she she kind of, she'd been editing Swamp Thing, and then she really started to turn it into a line with Hellblazer. And uh, she was also editing Wonder Woman. And uh, when I got there, we were just starting on Shade the Changing Man by Peter Milligan and Chris Bacello, which was great if you haven't read it. And uh, so it was just sort of building into Vertigo. And, uh, and what year was that, Tom? At some point said that, you know, you we ought to make you a separate brand. And what year was this when you when you joined the team? Uh, it was uh, 1990 AD. <laughs> <laughs> so, Elisa, how about you? What what was uh, how did you get to Vertigo? So I had, I was just finishing up Columbus fiction writing MFA program and was realizing that I needed to get a real person job like my other friends who could afford things and weren't living at home. And uh, the thing that most people did was they went to, you know, big literary uh, publishing houses to, you know, Harper Collins or Simon and Schuster. And there they would have uh, very little pay and be, you know, sort of um, treated badly by an editor and have no free time to write and also make no money and still live at home. So I thought that I would also look at um, Silhouette, which was a, a romance imprint that was uh, still in the city and at uh, Marvel and at DC Comics. And uh, I had interviews at Silhouette and at um, DC Marvel just pretended like that never happened. And, um, and what I remember is I, I uh, had uh, Dick Giordano interviewing me and Michael Yuri, his assistant, and they said, what are your favorite comics? And it didn't occur to me to lie. So I said, well, really, my favorite comics are the ones you don't publish anymore, House of Mystery and House of Secrets. Wow. <laughs> and they said, oh, good. <laughs> we know exactly <laughs> where you should go. Uh, Karen Berger is doing, you know, that sort of spooky stuff. And here, take a Sandman home with you and see if you like it. 
And uh, so that that was sort of and, and I was I think I, I've mentioned the story that I was pretty unqualified to be a comic book editor. I had story chops, but very little in the way of art background. Um, and for better or worse, Karen, who was pregnant, started to frown at me halfway through the interview, which up until then I thought had been going well. <laughs> You have a headache, don't you? And then without thinking, I reach over the desk and I start to rub her temples, which is what my uncle always did. So that's how I came to Vertigo. That's how you got to Vertigo. And uh, how about you, Shelly? What's your uh, what's your Vertigo origin story? I can't top that one. I mean, Car I, I thought, Lisa, I was certain that you massaged her shoulders. Nope, nope, temples. Her temples, okay. Listen, it's... Rumors have strayed from facts. I'm glad we have you here to, to, to tell it like it was. My story, which I know I probably recounted just last month, but I'll, I'll do the condensed version. Film, video, audio production major, college DJ. Got into comics in 1987 because of a film class. Our teacher used Peter Gross's Empire Lanes to show us storyboarding. Graduated from college, um, went to my local comic book shop in Philadelphia, picked up my weekly stash, which included Hellblazer number one, Tom. All right. Were, were you the assistant on that one, or were you no. later on? I bought that in the store, too. That was Art Young, I guess. Yeah, it, was, it would have been Art, maybe not even him yet, but probably Art, yeah. Wow, Okay. So I got a job at Kamiko first. I was so lucky. Uh, Diana Schutz hired me to be an editorial assistant. And then she and Bob Shrek left the company to join Dark Horse. So I basically was part of a three-person company for a year and a half. I worked with Rick Taylor, who was the art director, and pretty much learned trial by fire how to make comics. And I learned so much about art and graphic design from Rick and also from amazing creators like Peter Gross, Matt Wagner. The company finally went under and I swear it wasn't my fault. It was like, you know, other problems that had nothing to do with a 22 year old assistant editor who suddenly got a lucky break. But it was a few years later when I think um, Karen, I had heard that Karen was looking for an assistant. I think I was, I was told I was the wild card. I was told she was interviewing and she had it winnowed down to two people, but Rick Taylor made sure my resume got into her hands. And so I, I had an interview and she asked me for writing samples, went into New York and she said, if you want the job, you have to start in two weeks. So I was living in Philadelphia. My mom and I walked a six block radius from 1325 Avenue via Americas. And I landed in Hell's Kitchen in a one-bedroom apartment, rent-stabilized with a doorman, and never looked back. Worked nonstop for 22 and a half years. Wait, is the Kamiko connection how you got fables off the ground? Well, kind of, because I always thought Bill Willingham was a genius. I did not like superheroes at all. And I know Tom is going to cry right now, but never liked them at all and was offended by how women were portrayed in the late 80s in comics. So I got to Kamiko and Elementals was like this really modern satirical take on superheroes. And I had to read it. You know, I had to work on the book and I just fell in love with it instantly. So when I was... Bill's editor, and I must say I was the last editor of the Elementals. I basically had to chase him around the country. He was living in a, in a van, going from state to state, and we never met in person. And we, I don't even think we talked on the phone, but I would be hounding him for script um, until the very end. And I knew if I ever worked in comics again, I was going to look him up because I just thought he was that good. And I also liked his art. So I thought he was mighty talented. And sure enough, we did meet again um, after I got the job at Vertigo. Uh, but it wasn't for a few years until it was basically Neil who helped Bill and I get twist Karen's arm and give Bill Willingham a chance to actually start uh, writing for the Sandman Presents line. And then eventually he pitched me Fables. Wow, that's so, great. Yeah. Um, so as, as a bit of 
candy. So this is how I think of it. I think of it. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna ask you questions, and then we're gonna give you candy. And the candy is uh, each of you or some of you, two thirds of you, provided me with photos. So after every question, uh, whoever's <laughs> photo is this, feel free to take the lead, or whoever wants to. Um, Elisa, I think this is yours. This is mine. I'm sorry, I couldn't find any of our older ones, but this was, was this the last Comic-Con we were all at before the pandemic hit? I think, so. uh, I think this was 2017, to be honest. Uh, oh, okay. that was, yeah. Um, it was quite a while ago. It, it, it looks like it could be 1994, <laughs> based on the Britpop representation. <laughs> by one, one person there, I won't name names, but somebody was styling that day. Well, it, it wasn't me. I got to say that what happened is I go back and forth. Um, as I've mentioned, like in my day life, I tend to be like shepherding dogs around and hiking. And somehow I think I forgot to, to have a change of clothes. So I, was, I was wearing shorts. I want to tell you, like I have not willingly worn shorts in a professional setting since 1994. Um, and... Yeah. So what can I say about that? That was, so there's Peter Milligan and Garth Ennis in the back next to Stuart Moore, who's the missing uh, person in all of this. He was obviously, um, uh, I mean, he, he worked at Vertigo. When I first uh, came on, it was Stuart and Tom and Karen. And so, um, yeah. So, and there's Tom and Russ Braun. And uh, yeah, so what else can I say about that? All right. All right, so here we go. So who 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 are we gonna have go first? Let's have Tom go first. Tom, share a key memory of working at Vertigo. I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I got um with you guys talking about how you were hired and stuff, sort of it made me, it returned me to this suspicion that, um, that uh, when Karen was interviewing us, I think deep down she was simply looking for people who would not drive her crazy. Like she was from outside of comics and I think she felt bored around really geeky people and she was really sensitive and I think she hated, didn't like being around overbearing and loud people. And I think that's what got us the job is that for two hours, we were able to pretend that we well, were over the around. I think that what, what you're not realizing is that we were all super geeks in our own way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, geek really got me the job because I remember Karen had a copy of the book Geek Love by Catherine Dunn, which was a huge like bestseller at the time. I had just finished reading it. And I happened to say, oh, my God, I love that book. And she's like, oh, me too. So I think we all connected with Karen on different levels. Mm -hmm. And maybe she really wasn't a geek. And you know what, Tom, I think you're right. I don't think of Karen as a super geek or a weirdo. But I think of all of us here as definitely being sort of like arty and odd. I'm sure I got on her nerves plenty. Come on, Tom. Like you the didn't get on the hours the interview, you that counted at the interview. Okay, maybe at the interview. I'm I'm really flattered that you you think of me as someone who is not loud and obnoxious. It seems to me that particularly in my twenties, uh, I'm I'm sure I was louder than than either of you guys. Um, and Tom, you <laughs> shared an office with me, so I'm sure you remember I was chatty. No, uh, wait, well, no matter how bad we were, there were 10 people who were worse. Yeah, but look, we both shared, we all shared an office mm -hmm. with each other at some point. Elisa, you would sing ABBA, like some, you would sing uh, ABBA songs a lot. It's a kind of, I found out that that thing where you constantly want to sing a snippet of a song is related to Tourette's, which I hadn't <laughs> known, but I have this <laughs> compulsion to always, you know, break out into a little bit of a song. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I did that. So you Lisa, did you have the microphone? Give me, give me one key memory of working at Vertigo. Oh gosh, okay, so I am not by nature an organized person. 
and I think Shelly is is very organized, but I was not. And so in my early uh, days, I was sharing an office with Tom and Tom really, I think he mentored me because, you know, Karen taught me a lot, but she she had forgotten a lot of the minutiae of, of stuff. So he would he would teach me this and I was always losing stuff. The big rule of being a comic book editor or assistant editor is, you know, don't lose the artwork and don't lose the checks. And I kept losing the artwork. We had these flat files and the artwork would sometimes slide down the back of the file if you overfilled them with the artwork. And so you'd look for the artwork to return to the artist or to take to, to, you know, create the book. And sometimes it was gone. And Tom would look at me with his calm, which is unchanged. And he would say, he, he, he'd roll his chair around and he'd look at me. He was always wearing a Hawaiian shirt in those days. smoking. <laughs> say, it ain't food for the hungry. It's shipping late. I did say that. I did say that. <laughs> I had experienced losing artwork working for Karen, so she was actually not too fearsome when that would happen. She was all right. I need to find it. The, the, the first piece of artwork I lost, we actually had redrawn before I found it. Was it in the back of the flat file? I think it had to be, yeah. It's always in the back of the flat file, guys. Just, just yeah. know it. Yeah. And then it gets damaged. If you, you have to take out the whole tray. And then it's, it's creased and damaged. I never lost any art. I'm just saying. I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying. I I know that you didn't, but uh, I'm also sure you didn't cram the, like I was always like, I'm sure I can get that one more page. <laughs> it has its own tray. And so it, it never occurred to me to, you know, like, okay, if all the Hellblazers are supposed to be in here, then, you know, just keep cramming it, which is also how least, the flat files we had in that building were too small. The ones we had in the previous building were huge. See? And, and just that's it. Them. Now well, you at least it wasn't your fault. It wasn't, it was the fault of the furniture. Why did you wait 31 years to let me off the hook? Or maybe I just don't remember. I just, I wanted you to learn a lesson. <laughs> oh man, that's too funny. All right, Shelly, you're on the hot seat. Tell us one key memory of working at Vertigo. I think working with Tom in my first office, um, it was just, it was the smoking lounge. So um, I wasn't a heavy smoker, but I definitely would have a few throughout the day. And yeah, I just remember those, those early days of like listening to Elvis Costello, we had kind of similar taste in music, maybe not 80%, 75% simpatico. And I just remember that everybody liked Tom. So everybody would stop by to hang out with Tom and distract him from doing the work. And I had a lot of work to do in those days. I had to keep Karen in check, right? I had to learn the ropes. I, I was the last person in. I was Karen's final hire in December of 1992, and Vertigo launched in January. So it was a busy time, and I didn't have any time to sleep. I, th I don't think I slept for 22 and a half years, to be honest, but it was worth it. I think we did a hell of a job. <laughs> Tom, how was the music that Shelly played? Was it all right? Did you? It was great. You, you approved? Yeah. Terrific. Can well, you elaborate on that? A lot more than you thought. Can you, but do you remember, do you remember how I came in? I came in strong with one particular musician stroke band. So strong, in fact, I brought it to the Vertigo Christmas party and insisted we play the latest release. Does anyone here remember? No, I don't. I know you liked Paul Weller. That's it. Okay. Wow. Paul Weller had just released his solo album, the eponymous uh, Paul Weller experience. And that was a sign that my life was about to begin. I'm not kidding. You laugh, Tom. Oh, I know. That was a sign. I walked into a record store in Philadelphia two weeks before I had my interview and I saw the Paul Weller poster on the wall. And that was it. I knew something amazing was about to happen in my life. 
I got to see Paul Weller at the Chestnut Cabaret. There were five people at that show. I almost asked Paul if he had wished me into like vertigo, but I didn't. And, but sure enough, it all worked out. It all worked out. Now, Elisa, it looks like uh, somebody's uh, willing to um, offer a su suggestion. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, even today, I am the kind of person who says, despite knowing you shouldn't, like, oh, here is a thing that I don't want to lose. I will put it in this super special safe place. And uh, when you do that, you will never find it. Forever. Yeah, just You'll never, never, find never hide anything. Thieves will not steal it, but you will never find it again. <laughs> All right, so you guys ready for a little bit of uh, memory lane? Here we go. I'm not. I'm actually not even sure what comes next. Uh, this is from you, Shelley. Shelley, what are we looking at here? Well, this is a panel from a short story that I wrote in Filth and Grammar, which was pretty much what I described. You know what it was like sharing an office with Tom Pyre. He always had a mug of something. I'm gonna guess it was coffee. Perhaps it was tea. And I remember he was always on the phone, specifically with Brian Bolland. They would talk for hours and hours and hours. Tom was very chill. And I wasn't. I was always worried that I was making a thousand mistakes and I was going to get fired. So Tom was like, just my life force. He would always just be like, so relaxed, almost to the point of napping. And that's just what I would think about. The, the artist who brought this story to life is 23. She's a year out of art school, and she is, like, going to be the next superstar in comics. She just blew my mind. And, by the way, I asked her her favorite part of illustrating Felt and Grammar, and she said it was illustrating Tom's sweet face. Uh, and, I'm, and that's a quote. Well, she certainly made my desk a lot less messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i didn't want i didn't want you to start hating me all of a sudden no 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 i but thanks for the words about my comments though i was seething inside but... <clears throat> yeah we know all right so up to the next question because we're uh we're uh we're keeping track here what made vertigo special who who wants to go out? shelly you haven't gone first yet right um <clears throat> Perhaps not. What made Vertigo special? Well, honestly, I think the early days were epic because we all knew we were a part of something special. You know, there was uh, not long before Vertigo started, there was this great black and white indie comics boom that got me in the door. Like I said, wasn't into the superheroes, but Love and Rockets, man, like there was nothing I wanted more than to be a part of that vibe, to be part of music and comics. So Vertigo held so many possibilities for the future of comics. And I knew that Karen wasn't afraid to hire people that wanted to push boundaries. So, you know, I thought about being, you know, we were involved, we were on the precipice of something huge. And even if it, if it went the other way, like, I don't know, it felt like we were part of this great comics revolution. And everybody, brought their A game from the beginning. You know, we were working on titles, like Tom said, Shane the Changing Man, you know, provocative, subversive stuff. Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, which was like a favorite of mine as a reader. I mean, there were just, you know, the artists and writers we were working with, they were like true chaos magicians and provocateurs. I mean, I felt like we were really on the cutting edge of pop culture at that time. And, and I think it got even bigger and better as we were allowed to actually work on our own books. And we, I, I think we have to give that to Karen. I feel like she always hired editors who had very strong and very different points of view. She, I think she realized that it, it shouldn't just be one type of editorial vision. And when you prove to her that you had the chops and that you really believed in what you were doing i think she let us all run with it and that was pretty epic yeah what would you say lisa what made vertigo special well you know two things to my mind i think that um 
You know, this is so disconcerting. When I talk, my face becomes big, which means I'm talking at me. I just have to say, I'm just going to stare at your little faces because it's, I don't want to see my face. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, the thing, thank you. This is better. Um, the thing that I think often makes something very good is sort of a sweet spot between giving creators and, you know, editors or directors, if it's a film, the the freedom to really realize a creative vision. And at the same time, sometimes a certain amount of having to sell product can be good for, you know, we always think of having to be commercial as, as something negative, but when it's in the balance, some of my favorite comic, my favorite books, my favorite films were produced with that kind of sweet spot between nobody hanging over you demanding that it be completely commercial so people are free to express themselves. But there is a desire to appeal to a wide enough audience. So it's not, I don't know, I'm, I tend to be someone who really likes accessible stuff. I have a, a strong you know, genre sensibility. And I feel that on the one hand, you had stuff that was trippy and wild, like Doom Patrol and Shade the Changing Man, and um, and that, that played with, with, you know, subverting traditional narratives. You had stuff that was more mythologically based, like Sandman. Um, you had cool takes on superheroes like Animal Man. I'm, I mean, there's so many other things that I'm neglecting to say. So each had the particular flavor of, you know, that writer, that, that team, you know, what that book was supposed to be, but it was all very accessible as well. So I think we, we had this lovely balance between, we were supposed to be selling comics, but things were allowed time to grow. And, um, and we, we didn't have to be like every other product out there. You, it wasn't like everybody now do Sandman. We were allowed to have a variety of, of cool flavors. What about you, Tom? What would you say made Vertigo special? Well, a lot of what we've heard already, plus um, just a very high standard, I thought, of art and story. And uh, we had people who were not just trying to relive old comic books they grew up with. It was very, and Karen said a lot of that tone because she didn't grow up reading comics. She mm -hmm. didn't really care about comic books until she got hired, which I thought was a very important um, quality to have and it, it really it really like injected a drop of other blood into the comics bloodstream you know and uh but it uh, we used a lot of english and british creators and they were they had their own voice and it, it was very fresh and again they weren't just trying to do old superman stories yep um, the british invasion was a british huge part of it yeah. And we, I think we were the champions of creator-driven comics. Mm -hmm. And what we did as editors, we helped nurture that. And in some cases, we became part of the creative spark in our own right. And, that, and we were able to work with teams for a period of years, like Elisa said. We, were, we encouraged long form. We knew that things might not be big hits right out of the gate, but we were allowed to keep them going anyway because that was part of the gig, like help them evolve, make them stronger. And also, you know, like Tom said, we had super high standards for art and design. That was a huge part of it, too. I'd like to think that we made some pretty great strides in not only graphic design, but color theory. You know, we were in the, in the early days. We were just changing from um, Ruby Lift to digital color. Um, in fact, I don't think we went all digital till the mid to late 90s. So that was a huge leap. And I think the blue line color that we did, even in those early days on it, like Enigma, when, when Duncan Agredo, you know, would, would do his art and it would print on a blue line. You know, the assistant editor's jobs were very different in those days. And they were, it was a dense job. And it was a lot of work. Wait, Shelly. So oh, I, no. I just need to oh, break no. in and just say that with color, 
So one of our tasks is, uh, my task as an assistant editor, would I, we'd have these color guides, which were sort of watercolors, and then you'd get these uh, sheets with the little dots of, of color, and you had to compare and kind of, you know, see if it looked like, you know, that many, you know, tiny, I was ruining what was left of my vision, you know, with a little yellow <laughs> dot, one blue dot in there. And Shelly, you used to be able to just glance at this and you'd be like, that's R3D5, whatever it was. I <laughs> don't know how you did it. That's because I spent a year and a half pretty much as Rick Taylor's, you know, assistant art director. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I, I get angry with people who don't admit that editing comics involves art directing. I mean, if you don't have a visual acuity, listen, you can fake it. But come on, you really need to know your stuff. And I was fortunate, Elisa, I was taught how to color code because Rick Taylor was a colorist also. So I would practice on weekends with Doc Martin Water Dyes and I would code books and he would look at them and correct me. So that's why it wasn't just because I was brilliant. I spent a year and a half doing that uh, before I even met you. Um, and yeah, I, that was, it, was, it was one of my favorite parts. But I think that's why it made the two of us a formidable team. When, when Elisa and I actually put our heads together and co-edited a few projects, that's when things got really interesting. You know, as a, as a reader, one of the things that made Vertigo so special for me was this idea of remixing and rethinking characters that were, I don't know, familiar to me, a Swamp Thing or a Doom Patrol that delighted and surprised me. And I think that there was an element of coolness that came with Vertigo. So, you know, I went, went to the comic shop. I bought all my normal books. But I put the Vertigo ones on top. And I was like, hmm, I'm picking up some Vertigo here. So there was this coolness factor, I think, that, that even as a reader, we got that coolness halo effect. You guys were cool. <laughs> I think you're still cool. All right, so here we'll give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of candy after after dinner here. So, picture what what's happening here, Elisa. This is one of yours. Yes, uh, this was I can't remember years. Twenty seventeen. <laughs> yeah, it, this it was, was twenty seventeen too. You know, it might be twenty. Yeah, I think twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. This is a portrait of the three witches with great lighting outside at San Diego, at San Diego Comic-Con. Neil, Neil Gaiman used to call us the three witches. Yeah, no, I, I feel like this is our ABBA picture. Or the, yeah. um, no, this was really nice because the, we had, I don't think we three had been together, you know, in ages and ages. And uh, so it was, it was just nice to be reunited. And I had that this was maybe my first San Diego Comic Con since I'd been an assistant editor. Uh, I think I avoided, I have kind of a fear of crowds. And in New York, I could dip in and out. And I, I, I have a fear of LA as well. So I think in 2017, a friend of mine, uh, Anne Elizabeth, said that she had a booth. And if I came, I could room with her. And she promised me she'd protect me from the crowds. So. <laughs> Nice. Well, it's a great photo, and we're going to get on to our next question. How is comic book publishing different from then to now? Tom, you want to pick that one up? Oh, I think a lot of ways. Um, uh, the technology is all different, of course. It's a lot. You can sort of really run things a lot later. <laughs> get <them. laughs> um, huge for me, personally. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, also, the market is extreme, is very, very different. And um, you can, uh, you have to be satisfied with selling a lot fewer comics today, I think, than back then. <laughs> the, uh, I'm giggling because, Tom, um, I don't want to reveal the, your dark side, but sometimes your books relate to production. <laughs> <laughs> That's why what happened with all these digital processes. I can, I can be later than I was then and still be on time. But you were always getting in trouble. I was always getting in trouble for 
just, I would sit there and forget to work. I would just forget. But um, I, I overcompensated for everybody in the entire office by working did, like, like, like nine to midnight. Machine. I, I was a machine. You were. Yep. You're still a machine, Shelly. When I asked for materials, even for Shelly's first appearance, it just came just there were so many materials. Everything was organized. And then she asked what the what the show structure was. And then she rewrote it for me. That's the first guest <laughs> ever rewrote the show script and what it was going to be. And I was like, this is awesome. So and I say I was programmed at a young age. I, I'm part of a family business. I don't know any other way to work. This is it. Oh wait, here's here's one of the uh, the freelancers. She's a colorist, and she says, "Don't tell people that, Tom. Be on time. Don't be late. Drives me bonkers." So that's from the mouth of a colorist, of course. You know. Guess I'm not getting hired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> colorists just, always have to, colorists and letters always have to pick up the slack, right? I, I, no, I, I just I just want to say that that Tom is is you know underneath the the. Um, illusion of complete relaxation he, he actually does you know get things in on time and I mean when we were editors together we didn't always have perfect control I mean one of the things that I recall we had a big crossover event and what was it like one of our artists joined the army in the middle <laughs> well that's after forgetting how to draw <laughs> <laughs> So we had things that were not then I mean I had I had a writer I called him up to say where's the script and he told me he was dead. Hmm. He told you he was dead? He said, I'm sorry. You know, I said, where is I, I won't say the name of the guy. I'll say mm -hmm. I don't know, Klaus Smith. We used to, we used to speak with Klaus, you know, Smith and and uh, and he said, I'm so sorry, Klaus Smith just died. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't. That was that was the guy. That's anyway. really funny. Did you ever get the script? I did eventually. Eventually, there was a. a can, we used to use Federal Express like exclusively for everything. Oh my and, God. Um, there was an artist that was working for Karen one time who was habitually late and had real trouble getting started. Great artist. And uh, she's really hammering him for these pages. She really needs them. So one day he, uh, he said, I sent them FedEx. Here's the tracking number. It's like a 10 digit number. And he'd made it up entirely <laughs> just to get her off the phone. And, uh, so that trick didn't work. The pages didn't show up the next day. There was there was a time when I was working on Kid Eternity, and I will say the artist's name with this because I know he'd let me. It was Duncan Figredo. And Karen said, I need you to log in the finished pages. And I said, you know, okay, Duncan, which pages are done? Where are you at? I can't do, I can't remember Duncan's accent anymore. Sort of a Northern England, you know, it was very late. Yeah. Like, sort of, yeah. I, I ended up doing the Beatles. Sure. Or, you know, he's like, well, it's really hard to tell. I said, what do you mean it's hard to tell? How many pages are done? He said, well, I've done a panel here and a little bit there, and I've done this. And I, I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Take me into your studio and just describe what you're seeing. <laughs> So it was like a therapy session. Well, I'm looking at a canvas and there's a splash of blue in the upper right hand corner. And, you know, we had these these unusual challenges. Billy Wilder, the great director, said about working with Marilyn Monroe, who was you know notoriously late. You know, my Aunt Edna, I can get her to be on time, but no one's going to pay to see Aunt Edna. And, you know, we'd have... <laughs> Sometimes these really wonderful artists and writers that were uh, worth the Michigas. Duncan was wonderful too, absolutely. Oh, amazing, amazing! I, I feel like we were so lucky to watch the evolution of, I think, some of the greatest artists in comics. Oh, well, we had Brendan McCarthy. We had right on shape. Had... Incredible work, and then how about um, watching Chris Pacello? I mean, to me. That was a masterclass in what happens when you start out with talent and you just get comfortable with a monthly book. I always tell people to look at his evolution from shade one all the way through to shade 50. It is just insane. 
I feel like we all had the opportunity to work on shade too, right? Well, I've got um, a question. Can I, can I ask everyone a question? I, I've wondered this about shade. So back in the day, Chris Pachala did those wonderful overlays for the special effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, obviously if you were doing it today, he would have all of the digital, you know, ability to do those special effects. Would shade have been as good worse, better, or just different if it were done today? Well, if you wanted to achieve those effects, there, there are ways to do it. I mean, he could have still, yeah. I don't know if it would have to be any different. Hmm. But uh, I mean, if, if he did it today with all the experience he has, it would be very different. Yeah, I, I mean, that to me just blew my mind. When those pages would come in, I was just like, oh, like I would study them. Yes. And I remember I would spend we had what was great about Vertigo is that we, you know, we would we would only have the phone. Like Tom had said, we, we would have to use FedEx to get pages in house. Now, for people that lived in Europe, sometimes that took a week. You know, it, it was not like an overnight thing. But when those pages came in, there was nothing I liked more than going over the art with the artist. I will second that. I loved going over the art with the artist, like Chris. Chris Pacello, I had so many wonderful chats with him, but there was also a lot of fun to be had going over corrections with a writer. I mean, you guys, you must also have favorite people who used to used to go over corrections with. I mean, I, I would sometimes be in tears, like going over corrections on a certain script. I'm not going to name names because I don't want to give anyone a big head. But one mm -hmm. writer in particular was so bloody hilarious, I cackled. All their Don't best writers were really funny. Pete yeah. was funny. Peter Milligan. Jamie Delano was funny. Jamie. Uh, yeah. Grant, hilarious. Yep, uh, Grant. They're all and funny. Mike Carey. Mike Carey was a lot of fun to work with in that capacity. Uh, once, he, once he sort of eased into it. You know, I think Mike was a very serious man of all of our British talent. Um, tremendous writer and a, and a wonderful person. But I got the feeling he was shy. Unlike the, the prior batch of British Invasion artists and writers. And, and Elisa was the first person to work with Mike. I'm sure you have a great memory of what it was like working with him on Lucifer. Yeah, he was your slush pile find, wasn't he, Elisa? It was my slush pile find. We were supposed to stay after, I think there was a period of time when we were all staying after work, like one day a month and going through slush piles. And um, and that's how I found. And, you know, it's it's funny because I think there's been this experiment, like if if the greatest concert, you know, violinist is playing in the subway, who actually notices that it's not just a street? You know, it's it's sometimes harder to to notice. And I think um, and whatever I first saw him in was pretty rough, but you could see. I also um, you know got to work very early on with Peter Hogan. Um, who did the dreaming and other stuff? And he's gone on. I'm I'm having a brain moment. It, that it's a great science fiction. It's on the Sci-Fi Network. It's um, an alien. Resident Alien. Resident Alien, which I really love, and I feel like he's a wonderfully late bloomer, and that I think his career has really taken off. Um, you know, now that he's in his second twenties or whatever. Well, Lisa, now that you still have the microphone, how is comic book publishing different from then to now? Well, okay. one of the differences I think doesn't have anything to do with comics per se. It has to do with the fact that a lot of people are like, like what happened with Resident Alien and Lucifer. They're looking at comics as a sort of breeding ground for TV series and movies. And I think that that can be a great thing, but you know, you, I think ideally the focus should still be on creating wonderful comics and not thinking about, ah, oh, you know, what would happen if this sold into something else? Um, what's another difference? I mean, I think that there are, there's some really exciting, cool stuff happening in comics. I mean, I barely skim the surface in my reading, but I do think there's, there's um, there are more women and uh, more diversity in terms of the writers and the artists now, um, which is a good thing. I, I don't know. I mean, I have to say, I do think that 
that I'm lucky to to have gotten a chance to write for Ahoy, um, which feels in sensibility to me a lot like working for Vertigo, um, where you know you feel protected. You know that that you know as because I've worn both hats and it's a little bit of a different sensibility. But you know that this is a publisher um, that's going to take care of you. And you know that the editors are, are there behind you. I think it's it's that feeling of you know trust fall. Good, that's great to hear. And and there's a follow up question here. Uh, who wants to take on what a slush pile is? It's uh, unsolicited uh, material. People just s send you stories and are hoping that you'll love them and publish them. And how frequently do people make it out of the slush pile? Do you suppose? infrequently so carrie was a lucky break for both of you right elisa yeah absolutely absolutely now there's one thing i regret i remember one comic that i didn't pursue and i just want to say as a shout out if anyone remembers this comic i, I remember reading it it was something like i am not dog i am not man i am sharpe and I don't know why I didn't really pursue that one, but it is probably a great regret of mine. <laughs> There's always one that got away, right? So here we go uh, with the uh, fun photo of the moment. What do we have here? Oh, another one from uh, your, uh, your book, Shelley. Well, this one actually features Elisa and Stuart Moore as well. So Elisa is wearing a, a pair of gold opaque tights that when I mentioned to her that I have her featured in this outfit, which I remember vividly, she did not. So I couldn't wait to show her how cute she looked in her tights and her brown boots. And that of course is Stuart Moore, who really is, you know, we, we really, I wish we could have brought him here because he's really, he makes up the quartet. I think the four of us, um, yeah, we're really like a tight group. And Julie Rottenberg as well. All right, so next question. What does it take, what does it take to have a long career in comics? And, Not and dying. Also, what, what was that? Not dying. Not dying. Also, uh, no other prospects is very helpful. <laughs> So let's 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 take that one, Elisa. What what does it take to have a long career in comics? You've had a you've had a, a long and I would say winding career. You've done a lot of uh, things in a lot of winding. A lot of winding. This is this is what I think it it takes to have a long career at anything. There is there are a number of American myths that screw you up as a creator. One of the myths is I started out slopping pigs. And now here I am pooping diamonds every day and you know and it's it's really not supposed to be ups and downs like i started out slopping pigs then i was pooping diamonds then i was asking the pigs for a handout and then look i got a steady job you know so there there are many more ups and downs and i think that um it's almost of a necessity that you have to do some reinvention of yourself and so that's I mean, there are people like Neil Gaiman and James Patterson and Stephen King. They offer writing advice. But the problem is that they are outliers who have, you know, made it and made it quite big and then not had those ups and downs. And so it's useful, I think, sometimes to look it may not be, you know, I, I have a friend who says, don't be bitter around the children. I don't mean to be bitter, but. You, you shouldn't anticipate that perhaps you will hit the stratosphere and just remain there. And so if you love the material, if you love what you're doing, and if you, you know, you constantly get inspired and re-inspired by things. I mean, I think that one thing all three of us have in common is we just are excited by stuff. I was I was mentioning a Bucket of Blood, a 1959 Roger Corman movie to Tom. And he was saying, oh, yes, I can't remember if it's a masterpiece or I was delusional. And then, uh, but I think we both have that fondness. And, you know, Shelley, when you talk about your musical influences, about the, the new artists you're finding, I, I hear that passion. And I think it's, you know, 
that's what it it takes. Wait, can I tell you an artist thing, which I just found mm -hmm. out? So I've, I'm taking an art class at Visual Arts Passage right now as kind of career development and also just to drive myself insane. And John English, who runs the program, was saying that, you know, he, his father was also an artist and he really believes in defining shape with, with, with value and tone rather than line. And he said he remembered people like Sienkiewicz and George Pratt coming and saying, oh, my gosh that's a different approach. I've been very line oriented. Let me, let me see what I can take from that. So, sorry, this is a very long winded answer, but I think this kind of enthusiasm to continue learning and continue stretching and getting inspired by old stuff and new stuff, that's, that's, yeah. And, and hence, um, when you called me earlier, uh, why you were picking up what, booze and art supplies? Yes, yes. <laughs> You know, because they always go together. <laughs> it was booze and brushes. And when I told that to Shelly, she was like, mm, that makes sense. <laughs> hey, Shelly, you're up. What do you think? What does it take to have a long career in comics? Staying true to your core. You just need to push every negative sound that comes from anywhere, whether it's from in your own house, whether it's from social media, whether it's from your boss who felt upward and just push it away. Stay true to your own vision. That I think is the secret to success in life. And crowdfunding is pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. It is. It's a good way to have the audience actually prepay uh, for your work, right? You, as we all know, you have a pretty successful crowdfunding well, uh, run right now, right? You know, it's funny, I thank you. Um, it is, but it's also hard to make a living doing it because it's just, it's a lot, it, it can be exhausting. And the one key factor is that when you make promises, you have to deliver. And that's something that, I mean, I think that just goes across the board for life, but especially with crowdfunding and, but it's incredible. Yeah. I I've been enjoying it very much. I think I want you to just unpack that and, and any of you want to unpack that um, making promises and delivering what you promise. I I'm sure as editors, you've heard, you know, I'm dead, but also people have made promises or, or, or overestimated how long did it take you to draw this? Oh, I do a page a day. You know, what is the importance of answering accurately what your capabilities are and fulfilling on your promises if you want to have a long career in comics? It's, it's 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 important, but not everyone can do it. Not everyone can look at themselves and give honest answers. And some some of the people who cannot do tremendous work. And um, so it's a balance of what you're willing to put up with versus what you want. And uh, uh, I think the the main and I have not done this, but the main way to ensure a long career in comics is to is to give your publisher something that sells a lot. <laughs> um, have a hit, have a big hit, and you can stay forever. Um, I also think being willing to collaborate. You know, one thing that a lot of people forget, especially people coming in from film and from successful novel careers, is that comics is about collaboration and it's an art form. And if you don't have a strong, uh, skilled editor on your side, because let's face it, a lot of people that call themselves editors are paper pushers and they don't understand that editing is a craft. It's an art and a science. So if you don't know how to delegate and if you don't accept help, it might not be a good career path for you. You know, something that I, I enjoyed doing so much um, when we worked on monthlies was when we would see trouble ahead with an artist, let's say the artist got sick or you know, they were slowing down for some reason. Best thing you can do, you know, this is again, the editor as a triage surgeon, get that person help. So if that person is having trouble doing the, the rough breakdowns and the penciling, get a layout artist involved. Or if the inker is, is holding up the team, maybe, maybe that anchor should hire an intern to do backgrounds. I think the editor as problem solver 
on demand is a skill that they don't teach anymore at, at, in, in, in um, companies, you know, like, I don't want to say just large companies. I don't think, I don't, I don't see a lot of it or hear a lot about it at small companies. And I think that that is what kept those monthlies going. I think in today's market, people are deciding that it's okay to take their time. Oh, it won't be a monthly. Let's just make it a great mini series. The whole reason why long form was so exciting is because you had to hit your mark. You had to hit your deadline. And if you were going to be super late, we had a guest artist issue we were going to slot in. Or we were going to break up an issue and have somebody pencil the bookends. So maybe the first three and the last three pages. And we were going to get somebody to, to do the, the middle part of the story. When you work on monthly books, that's when you're really creating art. And I think that's why books like Hellblazer lasted for 300 issues. And mm -hmm. I say 300 because that's when the Vertigo series ended. And I don't consider the other Hellblazer part of the canon because it just wasn't the same. Not that it wasn't was bad, but it just wasn't our canon. And the reason why Sandman, I think, had such longevity and fables is because the editors knew how to structure the storylines and leave people in and out when it worked artistically mm -hmm. and when it was necessary. Those are key skills in, in editors. And I don't think people are teaching craft. Anymore. Well, I do think, though, that the markets move to a place where um, you have a diminished chance of starting something that will last a long time. Mm -hmm. um, things don't build like they used to very often. And uh, it's something I think about a lot and struggle with. I would love to have a Sandman at our company, but I just don't see anything. I, I just don't know what we'll build, what will increase its audience in 2022 which seems to happen very, I mean, when did Saga do it? Six years ago? And who's done it since? I mean, I think part of the problem is that people aren't reading as much. And, you know, in that where we're, our attention is more, more fractured. But I do think here's something else I think that's important for a long career. You got to keep reading. If you want to write or you want to draw and you're not reading what's out there, you know, or, or what came before, then, you know, you, you've got, you, you, you're just not nourishing your, your creativity very well, because there's so many great things to learn from, you know, to get excited about. I agree. I agree with that entirely. Yeah. Also, yeah. also, if you want a long career, I think you need to, you need to have a wide range of contacts and people, you know, and people who know you, you need to have a lot of people. And, right. um, you're going to run and, into a lot of people that you're better than and don't let them know it. <laughs> I think it's, it's very true that you need to know your, the competition and you need to know the seminal touch points if you want to innovate. I think mm -hmm. as editors, you know, we're always looking for something original. Well, what does that mean? You know, it, it's hard to pinpoint it. It's like, what's a, what, how do you know when something's going to be a number one hit on the radio, you know, or in the day? It's hard to know, and you just want to have your finger on the pulse. You know, you want to be there to make it happen. Sometimes you just have to trust your instinct. But I, I think that um, that definitely is something that Vertigo was able to do back in its, its, or it, in its infancy. I think that there was just this great soundtrack to everything we were doing, and it started to undulate. And even when other editors were brought in, and I think Lou Stathis um, is one of those editors who came in just like a bullet train with ideas. I mean, he was doing digital comics before we really knew we could do them. Mm -hmm. He had a book called Joy Suit that I will never forget. And I think it would have been groundbreaking. And, you know, to look at it was a little clunky, but it just had ambition and legs and it would have been such a cool book so i feel like the vertigo line took chances and even when things maybe didn't hit the mark 100 percent, they still resonated they st and they still made their mark i think in the industry and i think that was just such a cool thing to be a part of it 
I think even when you didn't land, and as a person buying on the newsstand, I, I gave you credit for giving trying, right? For not being, playing it safe. It, you know, I think there were times where the, the books were so out there that they were hard to enjoy, but at least you went, hey man, at least they're trying something different. And that's what, what I took away from Vertigo. You saw that little logo there and you were like, all right, I'm going to give this a shot. And, and it was usually, uh, usually hit a couple misses, but at least the misses were noble. There were noble misses, but all right. So we're going to go one more picture here. We're, we're, we're getting to the end. If, if anybody in comic book school and the community has any questions, tee them up. We're getting ready. What are we seeing here? <laughs> uh, that's back when uh, Tom and I were actually physically connected. His head used to grow out of my head. That was a painful period for you. <laughs> that's a I, I feel option. like sure. I gained a lot of your intelligence at that point. That's Stuart Moore and Elisa and me. Classic and Tom. We all on set together. Pardon? Sorry, I just said it was a classic Tom bowling shirt. Yeah, that's my checkered flag shirt. It's got a Goodyear logo. I, was, I loved that shirt. It was 100% polyester, too. Oh, great. <laughs> Who's wearing that Sandman watch? Is, uh, the Death Watch? Is that you? That's me. That's me. You should sell it on eBay. They're they're hot right now. I have no idea. I you know I have so many things that probably would have been worth something if I could find them. I moved <laughs> house a few times. I don't know what I've kept. Yeah, all your all your uh, all your Vertigo uh, swag is probably starting to go up in value as these movies come out and these TV shows go out. You know, maybe you could just fund a second life with those. If well, only. If only. Yes, if, if only, if I'd only kept better track of things, but um, yeah, and I'm, yeah, it's, it's uh, even trying to do the endless podcast. I'm also wishing that my memory were better. And I were one of those people that just had, you know, great recall. Instead, I vaguely recall, you know, various amusing things. It's in a very special place. So you can remember where it is. That's where your memory is. <laughs> That's your, your community support. Okay, we're getting toward the end here. What did you learn as a Vertigo editor that makes you a better creator today? Tom, we'll take this one because you're, you're, um, you know, you're leading an entire publishing house. Yeah, and I, I, I also write and I spent years writing and I shudder to think what my writing would be like if I hadn't been exposed to scripts by Grant Morrison and and Peter Milligan and Jamie Delano and and uh, it just uh, these were I like cut my professional teeth on them and they were as good as could possibly be. That is and true. I could get on the phone with them and talk their stories out and uh, you know all the good writers, all the really really good writers are open to criticism and suggestions and all the ones who just fight for every word are such hacks and. Um, did you guys find that? Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. I, yeah. I see the people that want to break into comics and, and, and it's going to sound really crass. Four words, don't be a tool. Mm -hmm. Nod and take the note. Yep. If anything is going to pull me out of a story, whether it's a word choice that is offensive for no reason, you know, without context, or if, if there's a tangent on the page, God forbid, um, I'm going to complain about it. I'm going to raise the flag and ask you to revisit it. And eventually, hopefully, we'll have a happy compromise. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, just be nice. You know, kindness is so overrated. And there's going to be other people with more talent than you. And guess what? So what? Because if they're not nice, you know what? We don't, maybe we don't want to work with them again. Right. But I would much rather help someone hone their skills and make them as great as they can be than work with this diva who I'm sorry, but really isn't a nice person to be around. Absolutely. Absolutely. The best thing anyone ever said to me in that job was uh, was, was Jamie Delano. And we were talking about I came to him with like a suggestion of a change and I was new and I was a little nervous about it. And um, he said, uh, 
as long as we can agree on what effect we want to create, there are a thousand ways to do it. And it was the wisest thing. Mm. Um, it's so true. Attitude to go in it. Wow. So many times the editor's note might not even be on the right page. Uh, yeah. And the change could happen three pages before or two pages after. If, so, if the setup isn't clear, you know, like that's why I still say the best editors ask the right questions on the phone or over Zoom or in person if you're lucky enough to live near your creator. So much is lost in email. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cadence in email is hard to, it's easy to mis misinterpret. That's and I, I still think there's nothing greater than reading a script that you love so much that all you want to do is race to the phone to tell the writer, even if you're asking for six changes, the fact that that script is so good that you can't wait to get to the phone, see, that's editing comics. And that's comics as art. And that's why I'm still in the business. Whether they want me or not, they just keep taking me well, off the pedestal. Right? Well, Shelly, since you got the microphone, what did you learn as a Vertigo editor that makes you a better creator today? how to pivot on my feet. I was a baton twirler in high school. So of course I already knew the dance step, but the most important thing you have to do is anticipate your boss's needs and anticipate your own needs and your freelancers needs. So I think I learned to be really fast on the job. Every time I picked up that phone, I, I, I wanted to know what does that artist need from me? They might need a script. They might need a new deadline. They might want their money. Chasing invoices was another big part of the assistant editor's job. You know, you had to really charm those people in accounting sometimes, which wasn't easy. They didn't always have a sense of humor. Um, but the ability to pivot, to really, to really get in front of the problem, to see it coming, and, it, and, and either make sure you can resolve it or get out of the way fast. Wow, that's great. Very good. That's, that's really good. So Lisa, what about you? Um, don't shove too much artwork. <laughs> okay. No, sorry. There's, there's more than that. Um, oh gosh, I mean, I think that we've touched on a lot of the things already. So, you know, it's about collaborating. It's about the give and take. And it doesn't mean that you need to roll over if someone tells you, hey, this isn't working. You just need to let it in, sit with it a little and say, okay, if it's not working as well as it could, what, you know, what can I do? And, and you, you know, sometimes my, my mom actually once said to me that every writer, whether they're at the beginning of their career or, or very far along, that their job is to figure out what critique to let in and what critique to, you know, stick with their guns and if you're not willing to let any critique in then you'll never be on the right side of that equation and on the other hand if you roll over for everything with every editor you you might be making some mistakes but I don't know I I'll tell you recently I've had the chance to work with Tom and I was getting a little confuffled about time travel. And he gave me wonderful advice. He said, whenever you have uh, an issue with it, always go for the solution that is more fun. And I think that that's sort of something that was also at Vertigo, that we, that we had so much pleasure in the work we were doing and in the stories we were reading and the artwork we were looking at, you know, it should be pleasurable. I mean, not every minute, because you, you know, I certainly agonize a bit, but, but you should delight in this. This is a fun thing. This is not, you know, cracking rocks open. Could I, could I offer potentially, based on what I'm hearing, the fact that, and Tom, you alluded to it, Shelley, all of you alluded to it, just the sheer volume of what you saw at such a rapid pace enabled you to begin to filter quality, see, know when to see quality, know when something was not going to work and not going to work and yeah. have a long vision. I think we don't see that as much, especially with the fragmented marketplace. Mm -hmm. We don't see that sheer volume. What, what, would, what would your thoughts be around that? Uh, it, you mean I'm, I'm not seeing the volume of work from 
Company. Like you see, you when you were in that office, you saw a lot of work coming in, not just the work you were editing. Like you said, you're reading scripts and yeah, a lot of work. And it was, you know, there were at any given time there were four of us or five of us, so a lot of work was coming through each person, and we'd see what everybody else was working on too. But um, I don't know what the I think I think since long after I stopped doing it, and maybe after Elisa stopped doing it. DC, uh, the editorial workloads um, became uh, greater. They were giving, they were expecting more books out of every editor. You know, oh yeah. Time to do this sort 20, of fussy 20, work. 25,648 pages edited. Wow. 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 I counted, and you know why I counted? Because I'm working on the second part of my editing trilogy, Fast Times in Comic Book Editing. <laughs> and my favorite story co-stars Elisa Quitney in The Bad Haircut. But I think what you just said is interesting, buddy, because the art is out there. And I just think people are lazy in this marketplace. I'm sorry to be like, you know, Madam Doom and Gloom, but I've been self-publishing with my husband for the past few years. And I am just seeing magnificent artwork coming out from England, of course, because I'm a little biased. I'm an Anglophile since 1974. But South Africa, Greece, I mean, there are artists everywhere. I scroll on Instagram a few times a day. I find people there. I mean, there are incredible talents out there. I don't think people take the time to look and they should that's why i find crowdfunding so rewarding the young women that i worked with in my new book i i met them through a colorist who i had been working with on bitterroot and she introduced me to them and i knew right from first glance i wanted them to work with me on the book i you know people have already asked me why didn't you have your husband just illustrate the whole book well i didn't know i didn't want to He's not the fastest artist, but I wanted to work with young women again, because I think there's this incredible, like new drive in recently uh, graduated art students where they love comics and they love comics more than animation. And they don't really know how to get involved in comics. And that's why I think with crowdfunding, you, you notice a community, a new community, and it's all there. You know, all you have to do is go to the right places and, and, and interacts. I don't think big companies or even small indie companies encourage their editors to curate. And that's what it is, you know, when you're putting together your own teams, it's curating. So I think people should just stop doom scrolling and binge watching. If they want to make comics, they've got to read comics and keep looking for amazing art and writer, the writers, of course. Boom. Wow. I love that. Okay. We're, we're getting to the end and, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer. So I'm going to share the screen, but then I'm going to ask for a volunteer who's going to go first with the final question. Um, but first, uh, a little bit of uh, surprise and delight. What, what do we have here? <laughs> oh my God. I need a copy of this. <sighs> that was a Halloween party. Um, Shelly, were you Nula? Or? I was Nuala. New, yeah, I think it's supposed to be Nula. I, I know this because I'm doing the podcast and I get oh, corrected really? all the time. You're kidding me. No. I never that. It's the Irish, isn't it? Uh, and I am. Tom, can you guess who I am? Oh, I just said it. You're uh, somebody with a very bloody nose. Are you, are you Two Face? I close Mazikeen. A, I'm Mazikeen. Oh, Mazikeen. See? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think the most disturbing part of that night is there was a guy who kept trying to pick me up and, and, and people on the street just kept assuming that I had been beaten up and I should really be in a hospital as opposed to going to a party. But so, they, they guessed incorrectly, but it was a close guess. Good enough. Yeah. Neither of us went as death, which we both felt would have been very cliched. Yeah, that I, yeah, you, I, did, you did well. I, all I ever wanted at that stage was to have like platinum blonde hair, and my hair was so 
dark that whenever I tried to triple process it, it would break. So finally in my old age, look at me now. This is me. All, this is all me. So there we go. Let's, predicting let's, the let's, go, let's go big screen. Let's, let's see. Show, show us again. Oh, oh yeah. yes. This is legit. This is old age. So dreams can come true when you work on the Sandman. <laughs> all right. Who's going to lead off final question before I, I'll pick a student if I have to. Pick a student. All right, Shelly. Oh, no. What's one thing you never told each other about your time working at Vertigo? Okay. This is big. This is going <laughs> to really upset Tom Pyre. Uh, and this will it. not shock Elisa Quitney. Buddy, are you a Shade the Changing Man fan? I was not, no. Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't even say it then. Say it. Come on. I, I told Peter Milligan to kill Kathy. To kill Kathy? Yeah. Oh. Good. It was me. I <laughs> encouraged him. <laughs> Look at Tom. That's genuine. That was genuine shock over the top of his I, eyeglasses and everything. I think all got very, 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 very <laughs> I think I see a tear in Tom's eye. He's not happy with me. I'm not happy with you. I'm not happy. I, How could you? How could you? I know. I know. She came back, but still. Anyway. Well, you know, sometimes you give people bad advice for good reason. You're, you've entertained everybody on that one, Shelly. <laughs> And I got a. I just noticed about an hour ago. I got texts from Stuart Moore. He's watching. Our Burton uh -oh. Stuart is watching. He's oh, going to be crying about Kathy George. Oh, he's going to be really pissed. Well, I um, I I I I will ask um, I will ask Elisa next. Elisa, what's one thing you never told each other about your time working at Vertigo? I'm a golden retriever. I told these people everything. I have no secrets. I've simply forgotten. I mean, Tom and I particularly, you know, shared an office when I was very nervous. I don't think there's anything that he would not have known. I mean, it, between the booming of my voice on the phone and, and um, yeah, no, there's, um, I can tell an amusing story, which, which, uh, Tom probably remembers, but my first book was published and I had a picture of me with Neil and uh, and somebody, I don't remember if it was Tom or Stuart, put up underneath it, novelist Elisa Quitney poses with a comic book writer. <laughs> and I forgot that that was up there. And so Neil would come into the offices and he'd sit in my chair often. And I remember the moment where he saw that. Um, yeah, but that is something that Tom knew and possibly even did. So that's all I got. This, did he, uh, was he a good sport about that? He was a totally great sport about it. Well, that's a good one. Now, Tom, how about you? What's one thing you never told each other about your time there at Vertigo? Shelly and Elisa want to know. Well, I, and I know about the rat. I know about the rat that was drowning. So... I used to uh, go into the flat files and hide artwork. <laughs> In here all this time, Elisa, you thought you lost it. Oh, Tom, come on, Tom. Give up, give up another secret. We, we know you have a few more hidden under your hair there. I was a, a spy. I was also being paid by Marvel. <laughs> I told them oh, everything boy. about you. Oh, oh boy. Wait, can I, can uh, I ask Tom, can you tell the story, which I remember you're telling me, it's one of my favorite stories you ever told about how you were working and you saved the rat? I was working as a home health aide. Yeah. It was a, um, I didn't save the rat. I was, uh, it was a squalid house and I saw a rat drowning in a sink full of dirty dishes. That was probably the most vertigo thing I ever saw in you real life. You don't remember. You used the urinal. You used the guy's I, urinal. No, his see. daughter did. I was afraid to. Who did it? His daughter. I thought that was you. Oh, no. I wasn't going to scoop up no rat and no urinal. Oh, my I God. I stayed far away from that rat. Which is why he's still here today. 
my mind is blown. I thought that was you. Okay. <laughs> I, Sorry. you keep believing that. I would like to apologize to anyone who was offended, but um, I am hoping someday to write the story of that rat. <laughs> well, I'm, I hope it. I hope it got over that experience. I understand they, that uh, Ahoy does prose pieces as well, Elisa. So there may be an opportunity if you know the editor. We do. I was hoping to do it as an epic poem, but I'm open to negotiation. We'll publish. <laughs> you can have two pages. You, it can't be that epic a poem. Oh, you it should get Duncan you know, to draw it. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, wait, here you go. You got you got a little credit here from your audience. I'm not gonna screw up no rat in no urinal. That's right. I'm, that's I'm, it. That's to the bank. Going to retitle this episode. <laughs> All right. Listen, we are at the end of our time, but I do want people to know both where to find you and what to look for on the shelves. We talk about the craft and business of making comics, and as I remind everybody who comes on this, uh, the uh, Guests come on uh, for free. Uh, they give you free advice and free input, uh, but there's always a payment. And the payment is you go out and you find their work and you buy their books. So I am going to start with you, Shelly. Where can they find you online, on social or wherever? Okay. Well, you're right on here, you've got my Twitter handle. That's your I'm Twitter. on Instagram a lot. My Instagram handle is at sxbondimprimatur. And I have been spending my days providing my backers with this, which is my first book on the craft of editing, starring a young Tom Pyre as the best office mate ever, and mm. Elisa Quitney as, as a very good friend. As the worst office mate ever. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. But that's, that's for the next part of the, the second part of the trilogy. So where can they, can they buy that book, uh, Shelley? Well, not yet. It was kickstarted last year. So at the end of this month, I'll be putting all the remaining copies that I've overprinted um, on our website. I run a comics and design lab with my husband called Off Register Press. So you can check there. And I'll also have a digital version of it, too. And who knows? I'm looking into mass market possibilities. So fingers crossed. But it's called Filth and Grammar. And Buddy, thank you so much for having me on again, twice in like five weeks. Incredible. And are you going to teach again, Shell? Oh, I'm still teaching. I, I'm only halfway through my course. So yes, I've been teaching on Zoom, a live Zoom class on editing comics and self-publishing. And does every so, episode of that Zoom class end on a cliffhanger, making people come back the next show? You know what? I wish I would have thought of that, but... No, by the time the end of the class, I'm just like, oh my God, that went so fast. You're fried. Looks like looks like the audience is happy. happy. Uh, Mark says, this was wonderful. Thank you, buddy, Shelly, Elisa, and Tom. You are welcome, Mark. And um, Elisa, uh, I, I know some, uh, some fans are waiting for the next issue of Guilt to come out. Uh, where can they find you and what should they be buying? Oh, what are we seeing here? Ooh. There it is. Girl. Look at Tom. Talk about salesperson. Well, well timed. Hold on. Let's 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 pull that up one more time, Tom. Let's pull that up. Get the get a bigger effect. Oh, what a night! Wow. That's it. Wow. And which this is Elise's is book. Is Go to your comic book store tomorrow and get this, or I don't know what to do with you if you don't. What so, Elisa, so tell them um, it's been a little while since you've been on, so they should be buying guilt. Guilt, yes. So that's um, that's my uh, Golden Girls meet Sex in the City by way of the Twilight Zone, is uh, is how I describe it. And uh, that is, yeah, that's the main thing that I've got. And uh, my endless podcast they can tune into, which is uh, on various. Uh, if you look up podcast and endless. It'll come up somehow. And uh, we're going to, Lonnie, Diane Rich, and I are going to be picking up with the Sandman uh, Netflix series soon. We'll be talking about that. And other than that, I'm also, uh, what is it? I'm at a Quitney on Twitter. I think for some godforsaken reason, I'm at Q 
kwitty on Instagram, but all I do is post my awful artwork for this art class. So please don't check me out on Instagram. Um, I, I and- shall right now. <laughs> that is, that is, those are the things that I am. And you, where I know they can also find you at your name, alisaquitney.com as well, right? Yes, yes. I have a website, which I probably need to refresh. And um, yes. Apparently, apparently you guys are too cool for school. I'm not sure if that was purposely too cool for comic book school or too cool for school as in a general. Uh, but, um, oh, and you're taking the booze and brushes class as well. <laughs> which which yeah. doesn't sound like a terrible title for a class, actually. So, by the way, for artists, Visual Arts Passage on Thursdays has a free drawing thing that they do. So check that out. You can come and draw for free. Bill Cope says, you guys are all great and too humble. I agree. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, you guys are. The humility is is, is here. Uh, booze and brushes, a little bit of both. There you go. Oh, no, that was a reference to the too cool for school. So, Tom, where can they find you? And I know that it will be, it could take 20 to 30 minutes for them to know what to buy. But can you give them some recommendations of what they should buy sure. uh, right now, tomorrow sure. morning? Um, I'm at, oh, I'm at Tom Pyre on Twitter. Twitter is the only place I go because... It has brevity. And uh, I, will, I will note, Tom, and no offense to Shelly or, or Elisa in any way, yours is one of the funniest Twitter accounts that I follow. Yeah, I, I, I was following you primarily on, com- on the at comic book school, and I would only see your things come up there. So I followed you on my other one, which is at Buddy Sclera, and I was go- scrolling through. I'm like, oh my God, this is a great feed. You look like it's very entertaining. I appreciate, appreciate that. We also have um, at Ahoy Comic Mags, which is the company Twitter feed. Uh, and uh, you got to go by Gilt tomorrow. And uh, on sale now is... Oops, well, let's zoom in on this Boris. so that we can get a good, good shot of this. It's by Matt Boris and Ben Clarkson. Matt's a famous uh, political cartoonist who wants to do comic books instead, and he's doing a great one. And um, this is a... It's like uh, sort of like really trenchant satire with a, a very silly, it's, it's about very depressing things in a very silly way. And I love it. Hey, Tom, any tips for um, our audience who maybe go to a comic shop that doesn't currently uh, rack Ahoy Comics? I, I was lucky. My local... Okay. Shop racks ahoy. I was I'm able to buy them retail, but mm-hmm. tell me about what people should do if they're not getting racked. Um, there are services that will uh, mail you comics, online, and there are and we're on uh, Comicsology and Kindle as well. If uh, if you're interested in that, well, guys, thank you so so much. Um, we talk about the craft and business a lot, and each of you have dove dive driven. I. Elisa, help me out here. What's the, uh, how do I conjugate that? Plunged. Plunged. (laughs) Nice sidestep. We plunged deeply into the the craft, but tonight we really unpacked the business. And I think um, of of the observations that I had, it was the commitment that you all brought. Um, You had fun, uh, but you worked hard. And it sounds like uh, that's part of what led to all of you having uh, long and fruitful careers. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you guys, uh, it was a long night. I'm going to ask you just to stay backstage. I'm going to put you backstage. Uh, There's free Twizzlers and a hamster back there that you can play with. So um, do what you will. And I'm just going to talk to my audience and close out. So stay tuned. Okay, so we're going to move everybody into the back. Guys, uh, I don't know about you, but like this was like a like a reader's dream come true for me to really get to know what was happening behind the scenes at Vertigo. There, clearly we scratched the surface and we're going to have to do this again. And obviously we're going to need Stuart Moore uh, for future episodes. We could really only have three guests. You can see the way it lines up. Um, but the density of information and insight should drive you forward as creators and really try to understand 
what led to these creators reaching this level of understanding of the craft and the business? What can you do uh, if you wanted to, um, <laughs> if you want to break in as an editor, if you want to break in as a writer, as you want to break as an artist, you should really be paying attention to them. The other part of the business, and I tell you this all the time, um, if they have willingly given you their social media handles, uh, that is an opportunity for you to engage. Uh, if you want to build your network, and Tom alluded to this, it's a lot of this is about the network. Um, really go ahead and try to build your own network and try to make sure uh, that you are um, taking all of these opportunities and really listening. Uh, so I hope you got as much out of this as I did. Um, I'm sure that we have a lot of discussion. Please go to the message boards share your thoughts. And of course, as always, the way we say thank you to these creators is by their books. So everybody for Comic Book School, uh, for all of you, thank you so much for joining. And uh, I will see you next Tuesday.